This is In Boot Camp, episode 19, Open Source North, on Sunday, May 26th, 2019, with your hosts, Matthew Petchel and Ryan Rampersad. You can find the show notes for this episode at the nexus.tv slash IB19. Hey. Hey, how's it going? It's going well. How about you? Good. Man, what a rainy week this week. Well, especially the first, I don't know, couple of days, and that uh, that downpour on Wednesday was pretty torrential. Yeah, I know. It just flooded the whole world, it seemed. Yeah. But not really, because the sun is out today, and it is actually quite nice. It's a great, great, nice Sunday afternoon, and, uh, uh, you know, summer might actually happen this year, so that's nice. Yeah. Well, I've been looking at my XL Energy bill and stuff, and I'm using a whole lot more gas this year, because last year it was like... 15 degrees warmer on average and it was probably also warmer five weeks earlier yeah yeah because oh, it's still getting down to the 40s at night yeah the, the plants aren't totally happy about that but we'll see what happens but big big week this week lots of stuff happening huge week in fact well so uh, i think we have to get off the uh off the bat here uh tell me about this strange holiday that changes your entire class schedule well, right now, here in America, we are doing Memorial Weekend. And Memorial Weekend is basically just a grilling fest now. And that means that Saturday's class has been canceled and Tuesday's class has been canceled. So I get two days off or two class periods off in a row. So I went from thir- I had class Thursday and I'll have class again Thursday. It just seems yeah. weird to have a whole week off. That is, that is a really long time. Did they give you like any homework or anything to do over that time? I'm going to say yes, but I'm not going to say I didn't open it and I haven't even looked at it because that would make me look bad. Oh, oops. okay. Yeah, um, no, um, it, I, there's a little mongo, uh, <laughs> mongo homework I have to put do. Okay. Um, it well, it didn't look like it was going to be bad. It's good that they gave you something to do. I, I kind of wish there were some more um, structured but offline activities, like in terms of if you're not going to be there for a week, you should still have work to do. But the homeworks that I have to be doing, it isn't due to like, so I have class again Thursday, so I have office hours Thursday, office hours Saturday, and it won't be due till Tuesday at midnight. They want to have the same office hours where you can go to get help, no matter if there's class or not. So because two classes were canceled, our homework's going to be due that Tuesday. So, I mean, I have like I know, 10 days and I think, to do with I something. I think that's, that's a dangerous thing to uh, follow because you should be... You should be writing code or reading code or thinking about code every single day, especially when you're not going into class, because that's when you need to be thinking about it more. Yeah. Yeah. That's a long time to be absent and away from the topic you're trying to learn. Yeah. So last time we had a show, we I was saying all the exciting things I was learning about the MongoDB show. Yes. And how we're setting up collections and doing everything else. Um, this week we started doing it in Node, and to start things off, we used a uh, Node driver JS something or um, Mongo driver. I can't remember what the package was called. I never got it to work. Um, everyone in the class that was using Windows had no trouble. They would open up a terminal, terminal, and just. So this Mongo DB driver is this what you were using? This npm package. Yeah, it had. I've, I don't know if it does. It have like five views every two weeks. It has two downloads this week. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And I bet that was our class. Um, so this unknown package that made it into Trilogy School's curriculum for some reason wasn't working. Um, people who were doing it on their machines for some reason it was working and everything else. And when I went to Stack Overflow for help. They told me to use another package called Mongoose to handle everything. Mongoose? And, uh, we'll get to that later. Yes. Um, but basically, for that class period, for three hours, I just pretended. Like, I was just typing what I thought would be right, but I was never actually able to test anything. Um, I just pretended for three straight hours. That's uh, pretty dire. Well, I mean, I was on Stack Overflow looking ahead, and um, so when we actually got to Mongoose, I kind of already figured it out um, and, and so you supposed that uh, it works for everybody on windows and, but but just not for you on linux do you think that was really true yeah and normally it's the other way around i get to laugh at them for breaking stuff yeah that is unusual 
So while I was doing all that, I was able to find stuff. Because, you know, when you start searching for Mongo and stuff, I was just kind of curious just how popular is Mongo? Because there's not a whole lot about it. Like, when I was looking up sequel stuff, I was just wondering if because sequel's been around for so long that it was so easy to find stuff for it or what was going on with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but there, Stack Overflow, huge resource for Mongo stuff, but there wasn't a whole lot of blog posts about it. Like, because, you know, I mean, yes, there were. It just wasn't the same volume of material out there. And so I found the site that claims that they have under 6% market share, like of all the websites they've touched and were able to figure out what database they were using, less than 6% use Mongo. Yeah, I kind of thought the number would be a little bit higher. I think, like, it actually lists the number of websites here, and it and it says that 6% of websites is roughly 10,000 websites. That, see, that is sh- astoundingly minuscule in, the ter- in terms of all the websites that are out there as you probably know um i don't know what um like what uh population this is drawing from but it's it's clearly a very small subset yeah because i'm just kind of curious like so most of my stuff so far has been uh, jQuery everything and stuff and i remember you were saying that yeah jQuery is kind of out of style now and everything else and i was kind of curious what people use out there and so i was just you know googling around because when you're in class pretending to do your work um, you, you this you're is, kind of just wander. You so you know when you start searching for stuff, you find a bunch of stuff. Yeah, and this is a good good choice, I think. Yeah. But anyway, uh, a lot of fun. Um, and then we got to actually using Mongoose and just didn't do anything. Just imported the module and everything just worked out of the box. Mm-hmm. So it was this ridiculous package that nobody uses for obvious reasons that I had trouble with. So so I've never actually successfully done anything with Mongo in a real project. I've had a couple of uh toy projects that people around the team have, you know, just showed and shared and you know, just tinkered with, but we've never actually used it for anything real. Uh so so tell me more about like what Mongoose is and what it does and how it works. So it kind of undoes MongoDB. So remember how last week I was explaining how there's no shapes and how I was having troubles because I was I made a hobbies array and I, I made the hobbies Pascal case instead of camel case. Like it was just uppercase instead of lowercase. Well, it added to the next th- line, a new hobby element. Like I wasn't appending to it because Mongo doesn't give you any errors. The shapes of your schemas are not defined. Nothing's rigid. Just everything goes. Um, there's no rules. And that's the whole, like, this is why no sequel is so cool. You can do all this stuff. Mongoose forces schema control. Um, so it forces it to act just like sequel. Um, in a way, but I mean, the syntax is different and everything else. So when you do, you get to define your shapes again, so it like controls Mongo. That's good. Uh, and you know, there's some other things they got better joins and stuff. Um, also, I guess people don't really do joins; they just make another data set and stuff, so it's faster. If you set it up right, I guess Mongo is one of the fastest ways to fetch data and display data. Yep. Just I guess it's not good for finding wares and joins and stuff on the fly yep so there's 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 i think that's pretty general knowledge and i think that's good to repeat so you know a a a regular relational database can do relationship building and relationship queries very easily because that's what the join system allows you to do uh and so i actually work a lot with blockchain and blockchain technology uh sort of has the uh the the pros and cons that that uh, are mirrored in relational versus NoSQL databases. So relational database, you can do the where and you can do the join. And in a NoSQL database, you can instantly go to your data collection, assuming you have some kind of primary key ID type thing. And if you have those two situations, well, then embrace blockchain because it has the same problems with both. So it's it's good that you're using Mongoose. I, I'm pretty sure that's pretty much the only and best uh, MongoDB adapter out there for um, for Node. I don't know what's available for other languages, but I'm sure there's something equivalent. Yeah. And so do you remember how um, I was talking about SQLize a few weeks ago and how yes. that's language agnostic and works for everything and stuff? It doesn't actually do everything that Mongoose does. Um, Mongoose changes the rules a little bit, and then so instead of you, you can use other, you could use Mongo in um, SQLize, but Mongoose is the way to go. 
Right. I would I would almost never suggest using uh a NoSQL tool like Mongo with a ORM that's very much so designed for a relational system. Just doesn't work out well. Yeah. And that tool RoboMongo is absolutely fantastic for viewing your data. Um so I was using DBeaver for SQL um mm-hmm. and everything else. It's kind of um, clunky this- DBeaver. Yeah. This RoboMongo lets you have a shell, like so you can see your stuff, you can do your finds, and it's just the best of every world, all in one. Um, it, what an amazing tool! Mm-hmm. So, with with Mongo now, what do you, what do you, what is your class hoping that you'll build with it? Are you going to just b- kind of build the same stuff that you did with SQL? Yep. Pr- pretty much exactly that. And That's we good. only got three days for it. The first day was set up and play with the shell. Second day was play with this package that nobody's ever used before and then the third day was mongoose and now we're completely done we've learned everything we're going to learn about mongo and we're starting react on thursday i gotta say that is uh an aggressive timeline do you feel okay with that timeline well no but i mean there's nothing i can do about it and i just you know uh that brad travesty that has a youtube channel has a mongo thing and i watched his i went home and watched his youtube hour-long crash course about it and i felt much more comfortable with it after well, that's good yeah. yeah i think just just having three days is almost barely enough like but like there isn't three a weeks. whole lot to it um, uh i think the tooling as you have seen mongoose is quite simple and Mongo itself is conceptually simple, but actually getting it to work, like the architecture that you use to use it well, that's what you don't have experience with, and I think that's what you'll end up uh, running into issues with. Yeah, and I suppose all our little exercise and stuff is pretty much just fetching and updating and yeah, and right. deleting and dropping. So when you when you have to have a custom and complicated uh, domain full of a dozen objects how do you model it like what do you do and if you don't have that experience yet that's yeah. what uh that's when you get into a real project that's what you'll be learning yeah well well um project three is going to start soon so yes and project three weeks. must use mongo yes and react that's very good those two things combined will make a wonderful web application probably yeah. maybe now you know, on Wednesday, we went to Open Source North, and this was your second time? This was my second time, and this was your first time. Yes. So uh, I uh, I often say about Open Source North, this is actually one of the better conferences in the area for a sort of a beginner in the in- industry. Uh, so the reasons I say that is it's local. So it's it's in Bloomington. It's easy, fairly easy to get to. It's during the week. Uh, so, I mean, you don't have to sacrifice. We can you just have to figure out how to get out of work which is not impossible. Uh, It's a broad conference. So instead of being very topical, like you're going to DevOps days or you're going to Midwest JS, instead of just being kind of shoehorned into one topic the whole day, you are given sort of a variety of tracks that are all topical among themselves. So that's front end, back end, uh, DevOps, you name it. And you don't have to follow them. And you don't have to follow the tracks. You can mix and match, which is great. And then the final thing Unlike some other conferences in the local area like NDC or Midwest, Midwest JS, this is a fairly inexpensive. I mean, it's it's a two hundred dollar conference. It's it sells out very fast, but it's ex- approachable for a beginner to buy themselves if they wanted to. So if you uh, were in a boot camp or you're you're in college, you could go to this and you could afford that most likely. I mean, that's not that much. It's not a thousand dollars, and you don't have to get a hotel or a flight anywhere. It's, you just drive to it. It's fine. So I think for these three reasons, I recommend everybody try to get to Open Source North at least once, um, you know, in their early uh, career progression, because it's just such a nice conference that's small and simple. But they, so you had a lot of new talks this year. Like you, there was nothing that was a repeat, was there for you? Uh, not that I could tell. Um, so I went two years ago, most previously, um, which I believe was 2017. It, um, I think year over year, there can be some repeat talks. Of course, they're updated repeat talks, right? So, like, if somebody's talking about uh, React 16 and React 17 comes up, they'll talk about React 17 next year. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. Six or the 40. Exactly. So, I wouldn't be surprised if there were repeat talks. Um, either the open source North, um, you know, talk put together team. I don't know what you call it. 
the t- the organizers. I wouldn't be surprised if they kind of push the repeats to the side and let others come in. Yeah. No, I would like to see that, but I'm definitely going again next year. Excellent. So let's uh, let's talk about some of the stuff here. So what what I mean, it's your it's your it's your show. So tell me tell me about it. Well, let's talk about right at the beginning. So I even I walked in. I was following you. We we're gonna go get our name tags, and then a guy stopped you. And I'm like, oh, this must be somebody you know and stuff. And then he turns to me like, you must be mad. I'm like, huh? He knows me? And I'm like, hi, I'm Aaron. I listen to your show. And that just blew me out of the water. There's people actually listen to the show. That's the first time I've met somebody that I didn't know prior that actually listens to the show. Yeah, isn't that cool? It's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool feeling there, isn't it? So hi, Aaron. If you're listening, it was really nice to meet you on Wednesday. Uh, Aaron will be listening in approximately, let's see, two weeks from now. So uh, release schedules. Yeah, release schedules. Uh, there are other people that I know that do listen that you also don't know. So, uh, just just think about that. This is fun. It left a warm, fuzzy feeling in my heart. Yeah, yeah. And we went to the few of the same talks with him. Um, I think I was just I think half the day I spent with him actually. Yeah, uh, we we actually ended up in the uh, big auditorium a lot. Yeah. Kind of funny. And they also have, um, like, it's this bag full of little goodies, so you get, like, a little swag bag to put all of the junk that you pick up from the tables into, but in addition, it has some predetermined stuff, so, like, uh... So if you wanted your USB-1 splitter and some other stuff, and... <laughs> your USB-1 malware-laced splitter. Um, yeah, uh, that, so that's it's pretty cool. Let's see, what else did you learn from this event? Well, I'm gonna be honest, not a whole lot i didn't i well i plus i didn't really know i mean you could see ahead of time what the talks are going to be about but i wasn't passionate like oh i have to be at this one have to be on that one there's this one i wanted to see because i knew brandon was going to be talking and i'm just like man i like brandon i'm gonna go see what he has to say and so that was the one talk i went there wanting to see really badly and so i just went from talk to talk just trying to see what developer people actually talk about and the world is very very big and there's a lot in it and while the talks were going on i was just on my phone googling stuff because there's they're using words i'd never heard of i've never heard of scala and apparently it's java but better and you it's java but different but you can use java libraries and i guess i'm never going to hear it again because it's not that mainstream anymore or will well it's i guess it's hard to predict what will take market share and what won't yep um what were some of the other things that you had to google well a lot of the talks were um, talking about this Kubernetes and Knative and all these other different things. And I'm like, hmm, I, that's something I could put on a resume if I actually knew what that was, because it sounds like it's super cool. Um, and it's just, I kind of just listened and took away what I could. And when I went home, I had to look up a whole lot of stuff. Yeah, it is. Um, It's an interesting perspective that I hadn't thought too much about, because like, I read Hacker News and Twitter and Reddit every single day, and I have done that for the past couple of years. So I know a lot about the broad industry terminology that's uh, circulating at any given time. Uh, so nothing takes me by surprise so much from from uh, at least general talks. Uh, and I've told you many times that I struggle to enjoy videos about technical topics because I can kind of just read about it faster and just go try it faster. Yeah. You've heard that before, right? Yeah, and there wasn't a lot of demos. Like, there was one live coding Gatsby demo, but that was like five seconds. And, and it wasn't very good. Yeah, so this was just a bunch of listening about very Broad. showy-offy kind of demo, but not really. Like, just this is what, this is what we do for microservices replacements and stuff. And Right. So, it, in the same vein as that I struggle with videos, I struggle with talks because... Putting on a good talk is extremely difficult, and it's not as if these talks are also workshops, so there's no opportunity for any of the presenters, okay, so take out your laptop and try this code with me, and then we'll talk about it. So they don't get to do that, and so that, that limits them, and it's also, I mean, you, you only get an hour, or and some of, them, some of the slots were even shorter than that, 30 Almost minutes. Almost a half hour, yeah. So there's not a whole lot you can do with that amount of time. And you never know what the audience is going to know ahead of time and, you know, all these different factors. So I think it's OK to kind of go into to uh, a conference like this and say, 
I don't necessarily need to have a uh, new and visionary insight afterwards. What is good enough is to actually do what you did, which is listen and then go home and Google a lot. I think that's actually what I use talks for, which is to just to to orient on my uh, own what I want to know. Uh, and then what I go to talk uh, to, to, to the conferences for is just to network and see what people are doing and chat with people. Yeah. Oh, and collect stickers. Uh, yes, I also have a ton of stickers. They're actually still in my wallet. And when I was getting gas yesterday, uh, I almost dropped all of them. So I need to take those out. Yeah, I started sticking them on my laptop. Oh, nice. Uh, one of the funny things that you noticed was uh, during one of the presentations, you you noticed this strange symbol which was a equal sign with a slash through it. Yeah, so, I mean, a million years ago, I started playing with C++ with one of my brother's old books from college. I know assignment operators. I know all these things. They're all the same language to language. No matter what language you look at, variables are assigned this way. Uh, comparisons are this way. It's all universal. They're all the same. And then I saw this equal sign with that. I'm like, this is JavaScript. This isn't in JavaScript. What is this? This is insane. And then you tell me, like, oh, it's it's a custom font. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, of course, I know because I personally use Fira Code for all of my editors, even my Java editors, which drives every Java developer I work with crazy because they share the same mindset that you have, which is, what have you done? It's been like this since the 70s. Right, exactly. And and so change is good, especially for those old Java developers. Uh so it's Fira code. It's just a simple custom font that you can install on your system and then have your text editor use it. And what it does is it adds ligatures to uh, fonts. So what that means is when you have multiple characters in a row, a font can have a special, like, if three characters are in a row, it can condense those down into one visual character, even though technically it's still three characters that make it up. If you've ever seen any of the emojis that have alternate modes... So, like, you have an emoji, and then you add some alternates to it. It can condense those all down into one thing dynamically. It's very similar to that. Uh, so, Fear Code is one of those, and Inconsolata is another one. And then, actually, Brian, uh, our good friend Brian, he told me about another one, which I will totally not remember. Uh, it's called the, the Dank font or something, uh, which is uh, another hipster font. So uh, enjoy those and uh, use them. And do you use them for all languages or is this just a JavaScript thing you use them for? I, I, I use them for anything that I open in VS Code. So yes. Wait, you do other things in VS Code besides JavaScript? Of course. How do you how do you code Rust? Oh, I thought you would just find something else for that. Because I know uh, you like buying text editors, your Sublime and all your other things. And you have so your Sublime IntelliJ... You use IntelliJ so, stuff, right? I or? use IntelliJ for Java so that I get really good IntelliSense kind of support. I also use Fira Code in IntelliJ. Um, I've tried using um, the C one, whose name I don't remember, C Lion, I think, or Rust, but it's not really that useful, so I end up just using VS Code anyway. Are you going to go next year? Yes, I am going to go next year, probably. Uh, and before we finish with this section, I'll tell you my favorite talks from from the time. Like you, I wasn't super passionate about any talks going in. I just knew some topics that I might be interested in. What I ended up liking the most was one of the security talks from somebody from Target. She was an infosec analyst, and um, I sure do love security because nobody, I mean, very few engineers take it secure uh, security seriously. And because of that, there's a lot of insecure things out there. And when I talk to my businesses about security, um, you know, the engineers totally want to be secure, but they also want to get their work done. And they also want to get things to market as soon as possible, because that's the differentiator in many cases. But the security teams don't necessarily have the technical knowledge and the capacity to provide us tools with... Um, with the comprehensiveness that we need to build security into our applications to to the demands that the business is requiring at this time. So, you know, it's it's a very tough push and pull struggle. So, 
I thought the talk that she gave uh, gave us a lot of good talking points for developers going to the security teams and for the security teams going to the developers to bring up with each other. So it's it's not an us versus them. It's an us and them kind of thing. We need to work together for this. So I thought that was a really good talk, and I enjoyed that a lot. And so this is in its infancy. It's like less than six months old, the project? Well, so uh, she, um, I believe her name was Yolanda, Yolanda Smith. Smith. Yeah. Uh, she gave a talk, and in the talk, she also demonstrated some software that she built called Spartan, which is sort of a, a Node.js package that uh, embeds security practice within the project itself. So, for example, th- that she used was in a Node app that was using Express to serve some APIs. Could we somehow uh, uh, easily enable content security policies? And the answer is yes, of course. Well... I think the project itself is really cool and really interesting. I love the idea of embedding security within the source code and not just as a policy document that somebody has to apply themselves package by package. Um, even even she, though, acknowledged, like, so what do we do for other languages? Like, what do we do for other non-node things? What do we do? How do we do it? What do we do for Spring, for example? What do we do for C-sharp.net uh, with .NET Core? So those are questions that remain to be answered. Um, you know, as far as the package goes, I'm not super interested because it will be very difficult for that to work broadly. But for my own personal work, I think that's cool. But I think the easier takeaway is here are the talking points for each side of the two teams. Well, that's very cool because I have nothing to come because I don't actually have to work with other people like you. You have to do all this stuff. You also have to be secure, though. Like, in all code that you write, if you don't sanitize your but inputs... I don't have anyone to communicate with and stuff. Oh, you, you showed... Uh, since that Firebase exercise, you showed me that uh, if it touches the internet, secure it. If it touches the internet and I know about it, you better secure it. Uh, one of the things that I do, and, and he- hello, listeners, uh, if you have code and I know you, and it touches the internet, and you don't sanitize your inputs, you're going down. Uh, watch you- out. You were showing me that an individual that you were going to be interviewing the following day had a resume with a LinkedIn profile thing and when or a portfolio and you looked at it when you viewed it, you got an alert. Hello, which I put there. Yeah. Yeah. uh, You have to sanitize your inputs, especially prior to an interview. Um, So you should do that. Uh, I will mention one other favorite talk, which was the invest in yourself and others will follow. It was a panel of uh, a couple of developers. Uh, one of them was a previously a BA business analyst. And then um, basically her employer was setting up new teams and there was only one other developer on one of the new teams and they were worried that they would have to kind of just not have enough teams. She volunteered to become a developer and the business was super skeptical, but gave her a chance and she became a great developer and she now leads teams on her own. And I think that's super cool. It's, uh, it, it, I thought it was really interesting. There was, um, some boot campers. There were some mid-level engineers who had flipped just like that person. And there were some even like, you know, 20 to 30 year old, uh, career developers in that talk. And I thought it was really interesting hearing about the different perspectives of entering the industry at different timelines in your career. Um, no matter when you are doing it, it's never easy. So just just because you think it might be hard as an in, uh, a junior, it also is hard as an intermediate engineer, and especially hard as a senior engineer. So it's it's always hard. Everything's hard. And one thing I did notice about Open Source North, just in general, was it was very, very diverse. Mm-hmm. Um, age groups and just everything yeah i think that's an especially interesting thing i have not gone to ndc which is the uh regional very large regional but also very expensive conference that's put on in the area i've never been there personally but because it is fifteen hundred dollars to attend roughly uh i think that prices out a certain class of attendance so i would say that yes open source north is benefiting from that kind of diversity due to its uh global nature uh so let's talk about um some other things that are upcoming so you've got group project three upcoming yep that's in a couple weeks 
got my invite to Hacker X. Now tell me, tell me your plan for that. Uh, it's June twenty fifth. I plan to go. I'll have my portfolio a lot more. Last time I didn't have anything to stand on, and this time I have a lot more to show off, and I have more than just yeah, yeah. I used Ajax to do some stuff. And look at this. It tells you the weather, and it it uses an API call from this site to tell you the current temperature in this. It's all hard coded. You can't change anything, but. I can do so much cooler stuff now. Uh, plus, I have a cool couple group projects. Should probably go back and undo some group member stuff and so, make it a little so nicer. As I've often repeated here, and I'll do it again, I would say um, sort of diminish your classwork and sort of uh, publicize your personal work um, because I think those are the things that employers want to see. You know, every, anybody can say they went to a boot camp and they can say they did some group work together. But the work that you can do alone will be far more interesting and um, complete. Yeah. And it's just a month away. Cool. So sometime at the end of June, I think, right? Yep. Or today's the 26th. It's the 25th. So less than a month. Cool. To get my act together. <laughs> <laughs> so so you went to HackerX before. And you're, if you go again, I mean, what will you do differently this time? I have a lot more confidence. So when I, I was terrified going into it. Um, and after... As the night went on, it got easier and easier. Um, yep. Even the people who had no intention of hiring me, they're all nice about it. Like, yep, yeah, well, we got nothing for you at this time. Nobody was an ass. It was just beautiful. Like, it was just, yeah, we don't have anything for you, yada, yada, yada. Um, and then we just talked about the weather, talked about something, talked about pets. And it was just, it was a social outing. It, it, it was fun. It was lighthearted. It was fun. A lot of people went there with a mission and, like, they were there for a reason, but it wasn't a formal event it was just casual go to table go to table meet new people shake their hands say hi um and just kind of see what people are looking for out there and yep. it was very diverse um a lot of people were doing c-sharp and stuff and i never hear you talk about c-sharp never hear anyone talk about it and yeah it's because i'm anti-microsoft oh i knew there was a reason yeah there's always a reason are you going i i don't know if i'm going uh we'll we'll find out on june 25th when i just appear suddenly yeah. uh i i hope you enjoy hacker x it's um it's it's uh, it's always a lot of fun uh you know of course uh you know polish up your resume before you go and and i won't be going alone this year or this time others from your uh boot camp are going yep I, t I told them all about it they already signed up um i don't know what they put down as a developer because it asked you to link your website and your other your current position at your current job thing just to make sure they're not an attendee and they're i know they're screening yeah uh, also that make sure they're not an attendee thing it's not real they don't care yeah mm -hmm. but no, um, so it's going to be fun to go with a few people from boot camp because I, I, I told them all, like, after after the fact, I told everyone what I did. And then they were yeah. all like, oh, I wish I did that too. I would say it's interesting to me that the, the, the U of M slash trilogy doesn't push for that more. Like, it should, they should actually have their own, I, they can't call it Hacker X, but they should have their own job fair kind of thing. And it's kind of appalling that they don't. No, and the people who actually use the career services are saying, like, yeah, it took them, like, three weeks to get back to my generic email question. Yeah, and it's not a good sign. I would say that's a bad sign. Yeah. Mm. But, you know, at least the class is good. So, where can we find you on the internet? Well, you can find me at MatthewPetrol.com, and you can also find me on the people section of the Nexus.tv. That's wonderful. And of course, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on my website, ryanrampersad.com, and on Twitter, at RyanMR. And you can follow us on Reddit, at our subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV. And you can support us on Patreon, at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Have a good one. Have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from, from the, the Technological, technological Convergence. convergence.